Good morning. Can you hear me? Welcome to the fifth annual uh, McCarthy Institute Microsoft Symposium on Trademark Law and its Challenges. And we are very honored and pleased to be here in London, England uh, to, to conduct this uh, event. Uh, over the last few years, we've gone from San Francisco to Seattle to, to New York City and then Los Angeles and now London. And we're anxious to see where we're going to go next. But uh, we wanted to make a few thank yous at the beginning. We want to thank our sponsoring entities and firms. We want to thank uh, INTA. And we have here from INTA the CEO of INTA, Etienne. Uh, if, where is Etienne? He can just there. wave his hand. We also thank Oxford University. Uh, which is co-hosting this event with us today and another event tomorrow. We thank, as I said, Microsoft Corporation, which has been our partner in this for several years. And we thank several law firms uh, who have been generous with their support and their participation. The law firms of Edwards, Wildman, uh, Allswang, Covington and Burling, Cadwallader, uh, Fish and Richardson, uh, Unitala out of China, uh, Perkins Coe, Hanson Bridget, Shapiro Cohn, and a couple of corporations, Thompson Reuters and Mark Monitor, both of which are in the trademark space. Uh, I would also then just like to thank all of you for coming and uh, participating with us today. I, I see we have a generous component of students. I'm wondering if you're here as a student, if you could just raise your hand and wave at us. That is awesome. I'm assuming you are either biology or nursing student. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're, you're, um, oh no, that's in the room next door. The, uh, you're, I heard a lot of you were from um, Queen Mary College, is that right? Right here in the law school. So that's wonderful. And they let you get away from class for the day or you just sort of did it, huh? Yeah, I know how that goes. It seems that students universally follow that pattern. Um, around the, the world. So thank you, welcome to all of you. And we hope this is beneficial to you. We encourage people to ask questions and to participate. Uh, so I'm going to now just hand things over to my co-sponsor, Russ Pangborn. Thank you, David. I'm gonna just make this very, very short. I uh, am so honored to be here. And as Dave mentioned, this all got started from the two of us having a breakfast in the Haight-Ashbury region of San Francisco. Uh, over which we were talking about keywords and it evolved into a lot of other interesting trademark issues that I at the time was working with Microsoft and developing some keyword policies for what uh, the business needed to do and uh, as we talked over breakfast it evolved into a discussion about many different issues that, that technology was challenging in the trademark space uh, and we decided let's have a symposium and we had such a phenomenal turnout in San Francisco that we decided to make it an annual event and who knew five years later we would be sitting here in London with a great mix of trademark professionals and students. Uh, so I want to thank you David for uh, your ongoing contributions to this and I look forward to doing this for many many years. Uh, with that in mind I have recently transitioned away from Microsoft so I wanted to make sure that we have continued Microsoft support and for you uh, Queen Mary College folks one of your uh, distinguished alum is at Microsoft and has been a colleague of mine for years. She's gonna come up uh, and give a quick uh, thank you for uh, the contributions that we've had, but I want her to also acknowledge the, the students. Thank you very much. I should probably introduce her, it's Elena Grimm. Thank you. Well, thank you. I just very quickly wanted to thank you for coming and for participating on, be on behalf of Microsoft and a personal Welcome and thank you for joining us from Queen Mary. I am an alumnus of Queen Mary uh, from many years ago. You were probably born while I was attending Queen Mary <laughs> College at the time, but if I see you have an interest in IP, keep it going because it's a great field to practice law. Um, I'm honored on behalf of Microsoft to continue the collaboration that Russ Pangborn and David Franklin uh, have created and developed between the McCarthy Institute and uh, Microsoft, and I look forward to many more symposiums in the, in the future. Thank you. All right, we're going to now have a short uh, video uh, from the Dean of the University of San Francisco Law School, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. He had intended to, but couldn't be with us because of 
uh, scheduling conflicts. Uh, so please welcome via video Dean John Trasvina. Good morning from across the pond and across America. I'm John Trasvina, Dean of the University of San Francisco School of Law. I regret that I can't be there with you today in London for what promises to be an engaging and enlightening symposium on critical issues in international trademark law. Trademark Law and Its Challenges 2014. Before I go any further, let me offer my gratitude to our co-sponsors, Oxford University, the International Trademark Association, and Microsoft. We are grateful for your partnership with USF, which has helped make this conference possible. Shortly, you'll be hearing from INTA's Executive Director, Etienne Sanz de Acedo, as our keynote speaker. I would be remiss if I did not mention two other people, USF Law Professors David Franklin and Tom McCarthy. Now we here in San Francisco are very proud of our San Francisco Giants baseball team. And at USF, when we think of Giants, we think of Professors Franklin and McCarthy for their years of work on trademark law, of scholarship, service to students, and service to the profession and to the industry. The USF School of Law sits at the crossroads of San Francisco and Silicon Valley, putting us at the forefront of law and technology. We're pleased that you could come to this event in London, hosted by our McCarthy Institute for Intellectual Property and Technology Law. The fact that we're able to put on this event in London shows the extent to which the world is getting smaller and the increasing globalization of law itself. The importance of your work today is demonstrated by the impressive collection of folks assembled together for this symposium, from noted academics taking on scholarly work in trademark law, to key law firms working in the field, to government leaders addressing regulatory issues in this rapidly changing area. By the end of today, you will grapple with the most pressing issues in international trademark law, including design protection, new generic top-level domains, and proposed changes to trademark law in the, e in the EU. The goals of this symposium are in line with the mission of our law school, where we don't just talk about changing the world from here, we act on it. For us, that mission means training our students to be skilled and ethical professionals who work for a better world. This symposium is emblematic of that aspiration. The great collection of speakers and attendees gathered here today is proof that lawyers, academics, government leaders can and are working together to solve difficult issues facing our world. So I leave you with a simple thank you. Thank you for the many sponsors and law firms here and, here and abroad who supported this conference. Thank you for being here and demonstrating the good that cooperation among countries and cooperation among sectors can do for our world. Have a great conference. Well, I have the honor of introducing our first speaker today. Um, uh, I am very thrilled that uh, the new CEO of the International Trademark Association, Etienne Sons de Cedo, has joined us today. Uh, I got to know Etienne during his prior role, where he was the head of communications and a member of the president's cabinet at the Office for Harmonization of the Internal Market, OHIM in Alicante. And he was an absolute pleasure with whom to work uh, in his prior role. And when the opportunity came uh, for INTA to look for new leadership, uh, I can tell you I was very personally thrilled that they made the choice that they did. Um, I am not going to take up more of his time. I want him up here to introduce himself and, and to the topic of the European trademark law that he's going to discuss. Thank you so much, Etienne. Take it away. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. Uh, Russ, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, David, thanks a lot to the McCarthy Institute for organizing what is going to be, I'm sure, a brilliant conference. Um, let me perhaps um, talk first of all about the importance of, uh, of trademarks. We all know uh, the different studies that have been recently issued by the uh, OHIM Observatory on Infringement of IP Rights. Um, the first study was delivered that was delivered was about uh, the impact of uh, IP intensive industries. And for those of you who perhaps do not have those figures in mind, um, I would like to remind you that IP intensive industries represent more than 21% of direct jobs here in the European Union. They contribute to more than 
for 35% of the European Union GDP. And certainly last but not least, the average salaries in IP intensive industries are 40% more than the average salaries in non-IP intensive industries. And that's certainly great. But then the uh, OHIM Observatory issued a second report which is at least as interesting as the first one. And it is about IP perception. And I have to say that study is not that great for us. Uh, so 69% of the interviewees um, understood and replied that they would agree that IP is key to employment and GDP. But 32% of them said that uh, it was fine to buy counterfeited goods to save money. 34% of them said that it was fine to buy counterfeited goods as uh, an act of uh, reaction against market-driven economies. And 44% of them said that downloading content for personal use was fine. And I think we need to reflect about that. This keynote speech is about emerging trends in European trademark law, but let me perhaps start with emerging trends in trademarks. We have, of course, the impact of uh, internet and the new GTLDs, and we're going to have a session about that, so there is no need really to talk about that. We have, of course, the impact of uh, new technologies. Uh, we have uh, 3D printing machines. And today, a 3D printer might cost between 5,000 to 20,000 US dollars. It would be a little less in euros, but that's more or less the average. And we are starting to see 3D copying machines at better prices. The day 3D copying machines will cost below 1,000, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to have one at home. Are we going to repeat the same problem we had with copyrights, with PIPA, SOPA, but this time hitting directly, affecting directly trademarks, that's something that might happen to us. We have also the growing importance of designs. Uh, more and more we see that the big international cases are design related, and we're gonna have a session about that as well. But then we have as well, and that should be a concern for all of us, a very strong and growing anti-IP sentiment. That is due to many reasons. The first one is a complete confusion on, in terms of IP rights. Patents, trademarks, designs, whatever. The second thing is that too often <coughs> trademarks as being perceived, are being perceived as the Fortune 500 uh, issue. It's the big corporations. Yes, but. The big corporations contribute to GDP, they contribute to employment, they bring innovation and research, they contribute to the social welfare, and finally, they give a lot of business to the SMEs which are at the heart of the European Union. So it's not just about the Fortune 500. And then we have, I would say, two growing conflicts. One is civil rights versus IP rights, civil rights versus trademarks. We've seen that and we're gonna see that again. And then we have probably another issue which is gonna become even more important than that, which is health versus IP rights. We all agree that health is fundamental to all of us, but we should not, and our legislators should not take health as a reason to limit property rights, and we should remind that trademarks are property rights. So now, let's talk really about emerging trends in uh, European trademark law. And in order to do that, I would like to raise uh, two issues with you today. One has to do, of course, with the trademark regulation and directive, what has been called the package, and the other one has to do with another kind of package, which is plain packaging. But of course, when we talk about Europe, we should not forget that, yes, Europe is a market of 500 
million uh, citizens, but Europe is just one more major player within the global uh, economy. And that means that issues that might raise in other regions of the world will raise as well in Europe. So let's talk first about the European trademark reform. And when we talk about that, it is impossible to um, discuss about emerging trends without looking at the changes both in the regulation and in the directive. The reform is, of course, of utmost importance since it is the first one since the regulation and the directive were adopted kind of 20 years ago. Now, the question is, is it going to be an evolution or is it going to be a revolution? Uh, we haven't yet finalized the process. It seems to be more an evolution, but if we do not have the right uh, pieces of regulation, when we talk about goods in transit, when we talk perhaps about renewal fees, we might have some revolutionary changes that as trademark professionals and as trademark owners, we would not like to see. So certainly the, the overall purpose of um, these changes within the package are harmonization and uh, modernization. And certainly INTA supports and welcomes these proposals. Uh, the key issue to us is that what we call the user experience should be the same no matter where you file your trademarks, no matter the route you're going to use, the national one, the international one, or the community one. In terms of process and timing, um, you know that uh, the system here after the Lisbon Treaty is based on a proposal from the Commission, but then you have two co-legislators. You have the Parliament and you have the Council. Um, the European Parliament has been very quick uh, to, to act and has been able to uh, examine the proposals in almost 11 months. Uh, on February 25th, the, par the Parliament formally adopted its report on the Community Trademark Regulation and on the Directive, and that proposal reflects a pragmatic approach. However, there are some issues that might need to be reviewed. The situation of the Council is perhaps a little different. Um, the Council is, is taking more time to, to examine the proposals, and we are noticing some differences in approaches from the different member states. So hopefully, under the Greek presidency, we will be able to have a compromise between member states. Now, let's talk really about the reform as such and the three main issues that, that appear here. Uh, the first one is, is about uh, governance, about cooperation, and about the financing of the system. In terms of governance, the Commission proposal contains uh, several uh, changes and major changes in the governance of OHIM. INTA decided to make no comments to such uh, changes, but as I've been a former OHIM official for 15 years, allow me to say perhaps a few words about that. And the words are the words of an IP professional, of an EU citizen. Why would you like to change something that is working really well? If the reason for that is that you need to align all EU agencies, that's fine. But why are you choosing to align agencies taking as the baseline one line that is below what that office has been offering to the users? We have different EU agencies within the European Union. Let's set the standard, but let's set the standard of an agency that is working well, that is delivering the right service to its users. So we would certainly favor no major changes in the governance of OHIM. The only thing that we would like to see, certainly, is we need to keep the priorities in terms of what OHIM is doing. And 
the main role of that office is to register trademarks and register designs. So that's the absolute priority. Let's make sure that that works really well. Now, the second issue has to do with the Ahim surplus. You know that Ahim is sitting on a huge reserve fund, and the commission proposal is about taking that money back to the overall budget of the EU Commission. And again, here, our position is, is quite, quite clear. This is money that comes from trademark industry, and the money that comes from trademark industry should remain within the trademark industry. There is a lot to do. There are a lot of problems in terms of counterfeits. There are a lot of problems in terms of educating the younger generation. Let's take advantage of that money to do these kind of projects. Now, in terms of the fee structure as such, the proposal certainly contains something that we favor, which is the application fee should be a per class fee instead of having one fee for uh, three classes. But the important thing there, again, is about harmonization. We need to have the same solution at all levels, community and national level. Now, if we talk about the level of the fees, that's a different issue. And perhaps the renewal fee would have to be reviewed. It doesn't make sense that today it is more expensive to renew your trademark than to register your trademark particularly when we know that renewing is just one click. There is no substantive work to be done on the side of Ahim, so there is no reason to have such a price difference. And finally, when we talk about fees, one important issue has to do with delegated acts. Where should the fees be in the regulation? Should they be in the regulation itself, or should it be part of delegated acts? Our feeling is that fees should not be in the regulation because that means that if one day we have to review that, we will have to go again through a process that is going to take a good two years that might have an election in between that will be stopped and that will have to start again. That's certainly not efficient. As a related issue, there is the cooperation model at OHIM. And we feel that if we really want to achieve harmonization, we need such a cooperation between OHIM and national offices. And the important issue there is not the money as such, which is certainly important, but it's the mechanisms to decide which are the priorities and the mechanisms to somehow control how that money is going to be spent. So here, you have different options. The Commission, as you know, proposed that 10% of the OHIM's yearly income uh, would be allocated to the Cooperation Fund. The Parliament has proposed to increase that and go up to 20%. And the Greek Presidency recently suggested that the amount should be equal to 20% of OHIM income or 50% of the renewal fee, which was the initial proposal in 2008-2009. Again, the important issue here is giving the priority to the projects that are really needed by industry and have the right mechanisms to uh, control that. And as a final issue, flexibility, yes, but to a certain extent. When we talk about flexibility, it has to do with the fact that uh, not all offices are at the same speed, uh, so to speak. And so uh, our national IP offices have requested the possibility of opting in, opting out from that cooperation model. That could make sense, but again, we need to make sure that there are control mechanisms and that users are participating in that exercise. Now, let's talk about uh, enforcement measures, and this is probably the second chapter and certainly more relevant for IP professionals. Um, certainly we welcome um, the, the measures that are being proposed there in terms of uh, enforcement and in terms of fighting uh, counterfeits. Uh, INTA is very happy to see that proprietary acts can constitute uh, trademark infringements. That's certainly something which is very good. 
we also support the Commission's proposal in terms of um, goods in transit. You remember that that was not part of the customs regulation. It was in the Commission's proposal for um, the community trademark regulation and for the directive. There has been some back and forth exercise, but finally uh, the Parliament somehow has supported the proposal from the Commission and we're very pleased to see that. However, this is not the position that all member states are following, unfortunately. We're also happy to see that small consignments are um, taken into account in the proposal presented by the, by the Commission. And we finally think that both the Parliament and the Council have significantly improved the Commission's proposal in terms of um, double identity when we're talking about identical signs and identical goods and services and the need to uh, justify the origin of the goods and services. Now, the third chapter of the regulation has to do with harmonization. Harmonization of substantive law on one side on procedural law on the other side. When we talk about harmonization of the substantive law, we see... Um, some of the changes that have been proposed at the level of the parliament that uh, might somehow limit uh, trademark owners' rights. And I'm talking about uh, the possibility to use trademarks for parity purposes, and this is something that we're not particularly happy to see within the proposal. There is also a risk for international exhaustion uh, following perhaps an incomplete uh, codification of the Dior case court, and we are somehow surprised to see that bad faith could be an option and not mandatory uh, as an absolute and uh, as a ground for refusal. Certainly, we are happy to see that uh, the graphical representation requirement has been eliminated from the from the proposal. Now. When we talk about harmonization of procedures, um, we are generally satisfied with the Commission's proposals. Uh, certainly, um, the deletion of the ex officio examination of relative grounds is something that is positive. Uh, for you to know, uh, today we still have 11 IP offices within the European Union that have such ex officio uh, examination. And the fact that you have it in some offices and you don't have it in others is certainly not easing the life of IP professionals and IP owners. So perhaps there are, one option is the model that OHIM has where you notify the proprietors of the earlier rights. In terms of classification of goods and services after IP translator, we finally have something that is easy to understand, which is means what it says, and we're certainly happy about that. And we are also happy to see the introduction of um, an administration, um, administrative procedure for uh, invalidity and revocation. The final issue, again, is about uh, delegated acts. And here, it would be important to keep what we somehow have today, which is, since the expertise is on the side of OHIM in terms of the procedural rules, we should keep that the way it is within the guidelines without putting that in the regulation as such. Now, what are the questions that might emerge out of this um, package? Well, the first thing is, what's gonna happen with the composition of the parliament? What's gonna happen with the rapporteurs? Uh, we are not sure that all MEPs that have been involved in this dossier will be re-elected. We're not even sure that they're going to be candidates from their parties. And uh, let me perhaps say something as a European. I find somehow shameful that in many cases, and I'm originally Spaniard, that in some cases the politicians we send to the European Parliament are not the most brilliant politicians we have at our national level. We have great MEPs, but this is not always the case. 
And we see quite often that we get as MEPs people that are just ending their career and want to be rewarded, or we see great sportsmen and sportswomen, or we see great TV star people. Are these the guys we want to take decisions and vote on important pieces of regulations for the European Union? I'm not personally sure of that. Now, the second package, which is plain packaging, and I'm, I'll, I'll try to, to be short. Uh, as you know, plain packaging consists in, in removal of all branding on product packaging. It means also standardization of the font, of the size, and of the placement of the brand names on, on the packages. And um, these measures are uh, implemented in tandem with proposals for a large health warnings or other mandatory, uh, mandatory features. At the moment, plain packaging is targeting tobacco, but that doesn't mean that it will stop there. And as you know, Australia was the first one in adopting uh, plain packaging regulation. As you know, there is a dispute resolution uh, that is still pending at the World Trade Organization. But after the Australian example, we've had New Zealand, now we're having Israel, uh, INTA is being involved in, in all these uh, projects. Uh, and here in Europe, we have similar uh, proposals, both in Ireland and in the UK. And as you know as well, at EU level, we had the Tobacco Products Directive that was adopted by the Parliament in 2013, where it is clearly stated that a mandatory health warning occupying 65% of um, the tobacco packaging should be there, and that member states have the possibility to implement plain packaging at the national level. We're not going to enter as ANTA in health issues, because this is not our business. But we certainly have to enter into trademark issues. And trademarks have a role to play. And trademarks play a role in making consumers comfortable with their purchasing decisions. And if you reduce the space of trademarks within packaging, no matter the product we're talking about, you're reducing the possibility consumers have to identify the right origin of those goods and services. Plus, by doing that, you're making counterfeits even easier. And on top of that, we should not forget that we have international agreements like TRIPS Agreement or the Paris Convention, and we should not forget that trademarks are property rights as well. And they are recognized, for example, in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And finally, when we talk about plain packaging, as I said before, today it's tobacco, but it could be soft drinks, it could be alcohol, it could be uh, fast food, it could be cars in the future, why not? Because potentially you can drive really very, very fast and you can have an accident. So we have to be careful and we have to see which are the limits and the boundaries between health issues and trademark protection. I think I'm just over time, so I'm, I'm going to stop here. Um, we see both the package with regard to the regulation and the directive, but also health issues as emerging legal issues that we should be following. And um, INTA has always been strongly involved in these issues. INTA will continue doing so. And uh, you will allow me to mention that uh, INTA will be having its annual meeting in Hong Kong. I cannot miss that opportunity, David and Russ. I hope you don't mind. We have already more than uh, 7,500 professionals registered for that annual meeting. And we really hope to see all of you uh, attending that annual meeting that will be our first ever in Asia. And that's very important because if we talk about the global economy, we talk about global trademark issues, it is important as well that in terms of advocacy, in terms of public policy, we go global as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Etienne. That was wonderful, and I am thrilled you gave the plug for into Hong Kong. I'm looking forward to going to Hong Kong myself. Uh, I'd like to call up the, the first panel of the day, and while the panel is getting set up, uh, I'll jump right in with an introduction of the moderator, uh, and he will then introduce the other panelists. But um, moderating this morning's panel is Jonathan Cohn. Jonathan is the managing partner of the Canadian law firm Shapiro Cohn, and he has practiced uh, law exclusively in the field of intellectual property and has lectured and written extensively on trademark law, uh, including domain name law, where he has concentrated uh, much of his work over the past 17 years. Uh, he has served on the board of directors for ICANN, uh, and he had the unique opportunity to be involved in the international internet governance and policy from the ground up. And as mentioned today, he has the honor to moderate this distinguished panel uh, on the balance between online platform providers and brand owners. And with that, Jonathan, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Is this on? Good. Um, very kind introduction, and you can now cash my personal check. Um, first of all, um, I wanted to echo David's uh, comments about students. We're very pleased to see so many students here, and we applaud and encourage the uh, McCarthy Symposium to continue uh, inviting students who have an interest in intellectual property to attend these things. And I also uh, hope that some of you will not be cowed by our age and jump right in and ask some embarrassing questions. It's a good place to do it. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that you're listening to and you may listen to again is that uh, the principles of law have been long established in a bricks and mortar world are now being challenged <laughs> constantly by the rapid succession of technological changes and the resultant online commercial behavior they've spawned. And that's really what this is about. Uh, rules for contributory infringement are not new. They were established years ago in the US. And, but the internet is forcing a reboot. We have to rethink some of these principles because historically, legal change moves at a glacial pace following after society and the economy changes. The changes are now coming so quickly, as we all know, that the law is having a great deal of trouble trying to keep pace with those <clears throat> changes. Today, we have a great panel. You got people here who have both in-house experience and in private practice, and who have addressed these issues and many others for years, and have a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, in IP generally and on online issues. Um, this is big money now, and uh, some very smart people are, are trying to play or game the systems. And uh, meeting the threat is the job of the people on this panel. Um, I'd like to now introduce everybody at the beginning rather than interfere with the flow, and also realize that after each kind of mini presentation that I'm gonna ask the panel to then chime in and ask questions or engage the panelists who've spoken in uh, some dialogue. And I also encourage any of you that have questions to jump in as well, and I'll try and make sure the time doesn't get out of hand, but don't be afraid to chime in. So in no particular order, I will start with David Bernstein. Um, David uh, is a litigation partner at the uh, prestigious firm of DeVoys and Plimpton in New York City. He's a member of the firm's Intellectual Property and International Dispute Resolution Group and is widely recognized as a leading intellectual property litigator. 2011, Managing Intellectual Property selected him as the Outstanding IP Litigator of the Year. The International Trademark Association awarded Mr. Bernstein the President's Award and the International Who's Who of Trademark Lawyers selected him is one of the top 10 trademark lawyers in the world. David is also an adjunct professor at George Washington University Law School and New York University of Law, where he teaches advanced trademark law. <clears throat> He's had a number of other important positions over the last few years in the trademark world. 
He has an AB magna cum laude from prestigious Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and a master's degree from the London School of Economics. And last but not least, his JD from Yale Law School in 1989. So we're very pleased to have his experience here. Paul Stevens from the European Union uh, is the international head of the intellectual property group at the firm Volkswagen. He was described in last year's edition of the Legal 500 directory as the first port of call for any heavyweight copyright or trademark litigation in the UK. That's certainly an important recognition of his skill and experience. Paul's IP litigation practice sees a Mac for both online platform providers and rights or content owners. So he's well equipped to discuss the issues that are on this panel today. He has real world litigation experience for a number of high tech online players, including Microsoft, Yahoo, and AB. And we have Jay Monahan, who is Deputy General Counsel for Zynga Inc with the responsibility for litigation, IP, privacy, and other issues. Uh, he was general counsel of uh, VUZ Inc., which distributes a leading open platform for delivery of high resolution digital entertainment. He was vice president and deputy general counsel for eBay, managed litigation and intellectual properties for, the, for that company worldwide. He's also been vice president of the worldwide anti-piracy for Walt Disney Pictures and Television, and he's taught law and business school classes at several universities, including Stanford University and the University of California at Berkeley. An impressive background, and again, right on point for this discussion. Uh, Dr. Frederick Mostert is chief legal counsel of Richemont, which as most of you know, is a company that manages some of the most famous brands worldwide. He is a past president of the International Trademark Association. He's published two books, Famous and Well-Known Marks, An International Allowance, and one entitled From Edison to iPod, Protect Your Ideas. He's a research fellow at Peters College, Oxford University, and a guest professor at Peking University. Fred is a true expert in this field and from the inside of a corporation, he's acquired the knowledge and experience that <laughs> adds something important to this session. So we're gonna to start today with uh, David Bernstein, who's uh, going to talk to us some about the background of the subject matter, which is the Tiffany and other cases that are pertinent. So go ahead, David. All right, terrific. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that overly generous introduction. Um, Jonathan has asked me to set the stage a little bit, uh, and so to do so, we'll look back historically at how we got to Tiffany uh, against eBay and, of course, where we go from there. And to set the stage, I'd like to go all the way back to 1946, which is when the Lanham Act was first passed in the United States. The Lanham Act is our trademark law. Um, and in that year, we had a really important case in Boston involving Coca-Cola and a distributor named Snowcrest. Snowcrest was distributing Polar Cola. And at the time, the evidence showed that uh, Snowcrest knew that most consumers going to bars and restaurants would order a Coke, and yet, nevertheless, the restaurants would bait and switch them. They would substitute much cheaper Polar Cola instead of Coke. And the question is, what is the liability of Snowcrest, the distributor, for continuing to sell very large quantities of Polar Cola to these restaurants when they knew or had reason to know that the restaurants were substituting um, Polar Cola instead of Coke. And the court held that if the distributor knew that most consumers were ordering Coke and that the quantity of Polar Cola that they were selling was uh, far out of proportion to what the restaurants possibly could have been uh, selling or the bars, um, that the distributor had some obligation to discontinue sales that they knew were infringing sales. And that case was cited by the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, in the Inward versus Ives case, which involved a similar situation, but instead of Coca-Cola, it was a, a drug known as cyclospasmol. 
And once again, you had a situation where uh, doctors were prescribing the, the brand, cyclospasmol, but pharmacists were substituting a generic version. And again, the question is, what is the liability of the, of the distributors who were selling to the pharmacists if they knew or had reason to know that the pharmacists were substituting the generic product and essentially, uh, again, infringing the trademark when somebody was prescribed and was asking for the brand and was being given the, the generic product. Classic trademark infringement. Surely the pharmacists are guilty, um, but surely the bar owner was guilty. But of course, it's very hard to go out after every single bar, each pharmacist. It's a very huge burden on brand owners to try to whack every one of those moles down because it just pops up again somewhere else. Much easier if we can solve the problem at the distributor level. And the Supreme Court, citing Snowcrest with approval, um, set a standard that is a flexible one, and it's one that makes sense. And the standard was that you can be responsible as a contributory uh, infringer if you continue to provide a good or service to someone who you know or you have reason to know is infringing uh, the trademark. That standard has served us very well. That case is from 1982, the Inwood case. In the 90s, we had a series of cases involving flea markets. Uh, the Phonovisa case, is this working? No, okay. Maybe let me, is this one working? Yes, all right. So uh, in the 90s, we had a series of cases uh, involving flea markets. The Phonovisa case in the Ninth Circuit, the Hard Rock case in the Seventh Circuit. And here again, the courts adopted this flexible standard and said, if you have reason to know that there's infringement going on, you can be contributorily liable. Here, they were flea market operators, where the flea markets were selling counterfeit goods, and the courts held the flea market operators responsible. And again, I would say this makes perfect sense, because if you're looking at the burden on a brand owner, it is extremely difficult for a brand owner to go to the flea market every single week, to walk up and down every single aisle, for all brand owners to have to do this all across the country, to find the handful of vendors who are selling counterfeits, whereas the flea market operator knows that this is happening at their facility. They see these vendors come in every week with truckloads of Louis Vuitton handbags or other products that couldn't possibly be legitimate. And indeed, if you, you don't need to be an expert uh, to often tell. Sometimes you do. Counterfeits, of course, have gotten much better, and, and that is a bit of a challenge. Um, but the courts basically adopt this flexible standard and say, look, if you have reason to know that counterfeiting is going on, you need to do something. Um, uh, Louis Vuitton and, and uh, Ralph Lauren and Polo have been very successful using these similar concepts against landlords uh, in Chinatown. If you have reason to know that there's counterfeiting going on, you have to tell your tenants to stop. And if they won't stop, you, you have to evict them. We wouldn't allow the sale of body parts. We wouldn't allow the sale of, of guns or, or illegal drugs openly. We shouldn't allow the sale of counterfeits openly either. And of course, this goes to the point Etienne made about the IP backlash. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people would uh, recoil in horror if we turned a blind eye to the illegal sale of guns or illegal drugs in these marketplaces. And yet they don't seem to turn any you know, horror at all to the sale, the open and notorious sale of counterfeits. And so that brings us to the Tiffany case. And in Tiffany, the, you, the uh, Second Circuit was presented with the issue of, of uh, the sale of Tif Sterling Tiffany jewelry on eBay. And Jay knows this case uh, extraordinarily well, and, uh, and so we'll certainly hear the, the perspective of eBay on it. But Tiffany's allegations were that uh, the sale of Tiffany, of counterfeit Tiffany Sterling jewelry on, on the eBay platform uh, was a widespread problem. They did a study, I believe the facts of the study were disputed, but they did a study that showed more than 75% uh, or so of the sales of, count of, t of sterling Tiffany jewelry on eBay were counterfeit. Um, I'm not sure if, the, if, that, if there really were problems with that study, maybe those numbers aren't the exact right numbers, but I don't think anybody disputed that there was a lot of counterfeit being sold. Of course, on the eBay platform, the vast majority of the products that are being sold are not counterfeit, and yet within this niche area of, of sterling uh, Tiffany jewelry, there was a significant problem. So what do you do? Well, Tiffany you know, took advantage of the Vero program. They sent repeated notices of infringement to eBay, and each time uh, eBay got one, they took it down. 
Um, and so the takedown, uh, the notice and takedown process worked for each individual listing, and yet the problem persists. And so the question is, what is uh, the respective burdens on the, the, uh, uh, the platform, whether it's the flea market operator or eBay, what are the burdens on the brand owner? And if you've got a, no, a, a persistent problem, at what point do you look at it and say, the platform or the, the flea market operator has some obligation here? And so Tiffany uh, ultimately brought a challenge against eBay, saying you are a contributory uh, 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 infringer. You have reason to know that there's a lot of counterfeiting going on. I mean, it, it brings back sort of the Casablanca uh, uh, you know, no, notice. I mean, there's gambling going on here. Shocking, of course. Um, and so you know this is happening, and you, and you are continuing to provide a service, the eBay platform, the ability to sell these products, to people who you know or have reason to know are infringers. You, therefore, are a, a, a liable as well. Now, the court in that case documented, I thought quite persuasively, all of the things that eBay does to prevent the sale of counterfeits. They have the Vero program. They give brand owners the opportunity to post about me pages to tell people how to distinguish counterfeits. They um, have their own internal fraud protection engines. They do a lot to themselves stop repeat infringers from selling. And so I think in that case, you know, one could very easily say, actually, eBay did a lot. And eBay may not have been liable in that case. And I'm not here to pick sides between Tiffany and eBay, but the thing that troubled me about the court's opinion is that the court, I believe, disregarded the common law history of contributory liability and the standards set by the US Supreme Court in Inwood and the First Circuit case in uh, Snowcrest and said that generalized knowledge of illegal activity is not enough. In order to be responsible as a contributory uh, infringer, you have to have specific knowledge of the particular listings that are counterfeit and continue to provide that service. And the problem with that standard, although it's a very nice bright line rule, it allows platforms, or frankly I would say even flea market operators, to have cases dismissed where they didn't know this exact vendor was responsible, the problem with that standard is it takes away the flexibility. It takes away the ability for the courts to look and see, what did you know? Indeed, I think it even uh, uh, disregards a lot of the had reason to know part of the standard. It really becomes very specific knowledge. So I'm, we're going to debate these issues more. Since Tiffany, which is a 2010 case, we've not had another court opinion that really considered it. We have had a number of additional flea market cases. And some of them you know, have a challenge, because very often the flea market owner knows there's some counterfeiting going on, but might not know it's vendor 287. And yet what the courts have done is they've started to distinguish the online and the offline worlds. And they've said, in the online world, where eBay is so massive, there's so many listings. And by the way, a good point on the platform side is, eBay never has physical possession of the goods. They can't walk up and down the aisles and look at the goods themselves. In that context, the courts are saying, this test of requiring specific knowledge makes more sense. But in the offline world, in the flea market world, where you see the vendors coming in every day, where you have the ability to walk up and down, generalized knowledge may still be enough, although they're not using the terms generalized knowledge anymore, because Tiffany sort of says that's improper. They're really saying uh, you have reason to know which specific sellers are there. I'm not so sure that the distinction between the online and the offline worlds makes sense. Indeed, I would take a little issue with one of Jonathan's early comments, which is that the internet has changed all this. I actually think the common law standards that we've developed over decades still work in this new uh, forum. I don't think the forum is so different that it requires us to throw out the common law standards that we've used. Rather, it requires judges to approach these issues using the same notions of, what's, uh, of a flexible standard, of what's reasonable. And in, in my article, I talk about the obligation to take reasonable precautions when you reasonably can anticipate that there's going to be infringement. And indeed, one nice thing about the flexible standard is that what eBay did in 2010 I would argue was appropriate. And I would say there's very good reasons to believe that eBay was not contributorily liable in 2010. But the state of the art and the state of technology could evolve. It could be by 2020, 
eBay, and despite the size of uh, the marketplace, despite the number of sellers, that eBay might have more of an ability using technology to really p know themselves which, in which listings are counterfeit and to do more than they're doing. And yet I think what the Second Circuit has done with this test requiring specific knowledge is it's locked us in to a very bright line rule, but one that lacks the flexibility for us to deal with counterfeiting in, in this environment. So I know we'll come back to it, but that's a little bit of an introduction to uh, get the debate started. That's great, David. Um, okay, panel, any comments? Oh, I, think we're gonna, I think we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going, dude. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the vote's just been in. We're going to keep going. Blood on the <laughs> I just got outvoted. Um, Paul Stevens will be next. He's going to talk about the law of unintended consequences, the status of database rights in Europe. <clears throat> so uh, um, I'm also uh, an alumni of QMW. Um, uh, in fact, my... Um, founding knowledge uh, of IP law uh, 25 years ago uh, started at QMW. I graduated from Durham, but um, IP law as a, a topic wasn't widely taught, and um, QMW was one of the very first uh, places that, that um, picked up on IP law as, um, as a topic to, to teach, and uh, has been fascinating me ever since. Um, I'm the European on the panel, um, and as the Europeans in the audience uh, know, uh, we have no harmonization across Europe in relation to uh, contributory infringement. There's no unified thought process. We obviously have harmonized law that uh, tackles trademarks. There's harmonized law that tackles enforcement. Uh, but there's no harmonized law when it comes to contributory infringement. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, how, how can I contribute to this debate? And I thought that one of the ways in which uh, we've ended up with a balance, perhaps, between um, brand owners, rights owners on the one hand, and then platform uh, owners or service providers on the other, um, has been as a result of uh, judicial discretion. So um, I'm going to uh, advocate. It's worked, excellent. Uh, I'm going to advocate um, judicial discretion as one of the ways in which we can solve um, some of the difficult challenges we have. I slightly disagree in terms of um, the evolution and the way in which um, things change and the way in which the internet uh, has, has evolved so quickly. Very often technologies come thick and fast and it's difficult to keep on top of, um, uh, as a rights owner, it's difficult to keep on top of uh, the evolution of those changes and for the law to keep on top of those. So ju judges often strike a balance between the parties and I've, I've cited two um, European Court of Justice cases as being examples of those. Um, Google France and uh, LVMH, uh, now, now a little old in 2010, where Google, as the search engine provider, was not liable for the sale of a keyword to an advertiser to get that sponsored result, to get that advertisement. Uh, but the purchaser of that keyword may be liable for using the keyword if it results in confusion. So you've got this tension between the service provider not being directly liable, but their customer potentially being liable, and consequently it affecting the way in which the, the customer behaves and, and forces the customer to, to, um, to consider the impact of the purchase of the relevant keyword. So a balance is struck. Similarly, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the European Court uh, decision in Svensson, uh, all to do with linking. I've got a case that's going to the UK, UK Supreme Court um, in a few months uh, to do with linking and to do with contributory liability in relation to linking. Svensson uh, dealt with linking uh, this way. It, it said, essentially, if you're linking to authorized content, no infringement. If you're linking to unauthorized content, infringement. So, again, it puts a, an obligation um, on the person taking an active step to be responsible uh, for, their, uh, for their actions. Not necessarily an easy one to resolve if you are a search engine, but certainly um, uh, for most people providing links, you have a responsibility in relation to your, your content. So what happens when discretion is removed? Um, and I picked out an example uh, for European law uh, of database rights. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, a number of Americans in the audience, certainly, uh, because it's a, it's a European, peculiar European right. Uh, it's like copyright. It's freestanding. It's separate from copyright. Uh, it lasts 15 years. 
Um, it protects the contents of a database by preventing extraction or reuse of the data. It's granted automatically, uh, and it's granted for the investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the contents of a database. Its purpose was to encourage the growth of the knowledge economy. Uh, as Europeans, we looked across the Atlantic and we kind of were fearful of the big tech companies. And we thought, what, what is it that we can do to help our own uh, fledgling uh, industry? And one of the, the things that we came up with was the database right to encourage uh, that innovation. However, when we look at infringement, um, infringement arises where the extraction or reuse of the data is qualitatively or quantitatively substantial. So if you extract or reuse data um, from the database, uh, then you are an infringer unless you have consent. Uh, but that infringement can also be insubstantial, um, repeated, and, uh, and systematic. So if it's insubstantial, small but regular helpings from a database can also be an infringement. But the key point I wanted to make was, was that the defenses in relation to infringement um, are very, very limited indeed. So you aren't an infringer for private purposes, teaching or scientific research for non-commercial purposes. There is no fair use defense. So for, again, Americans in the audience thinking about copyright with no ability to argue um, a fair use, um, imagine that uh, in relation to your, your copyright works. So where does that, where does that lead us? <clears throat> Well, where it's led us is to a whole series of litigation where you have single source database owners who have sought to assert their, their dominant position. And by single source database owners, um, what I mean are people who not only collect together pre-existing data, but who are the creators of the data in the first place. They are the single sources of that data. So the sort of people that you are thinking about in that, in that context might be, for example, stock markets. So people who run and own stock markets, the share data, the share information, the prices of that share information, they are the people who will be collecting together that data, but they're also effectively the ones that are creating the data because they're running the market. They're the ones that are investing in the creation of that data. And the consequences is, is that uh, you've seen these database owners Rather than thinking about copyright, they start to, to law shop uh, and they're starting to uh, assert those rights um, because of the significant protection that they afford. And the impact then is, and whether it's for uh, rights owners and brand owners or whether it's for platforms, you start to see um, behavior where uh, single source data, database owners um, acquire this unintended protection. So for example, uh, if you think about government data, census information, health data, all this information which previously might have been available and thought not to have been um, something that was controlled, now is controlled. Um, comparisons of prices. Uh, Ryanair, uh, who in Europe is a, a well-known, if not well-liked um, uh, airline, um, uh, its business model is based around the fact that you have to go through its website, you have to use um, its drop-down menus, you have to buy its insurance unless you can find the very little box in the left-hand corner quite a way away that you have to tick. It's just a joke. Uh, <laughs> but um, you, have, you have to go through their website, and they have had a systematic um, uh, uh, set of proceedings around Europe uh, where they have stopped people from using um, or sought to stop people using their price data to, to be able to make price comparisons, in able to be able to book in a, a way other than using their website. And just, just last week, there's been a reference now uh, on, on effectively uh, proceedings that they've brought all to do with the terms and conditions uh, around their contract. So my little contribution to this is to say, um, uh, if you tie the hands of the, leg uh, you tie the hands of the judges too carefully, or too much in terms of um, depriving them of their ability to strike a balance between the brand owners, or not, brand owners on, the white, on the one hand and the platform owners on the other, then you end up with a whole series of unintended consequences. Thanks, Paul. Um, moving right along, we have Fred and Jay are going to do a kind of a combined presentation. 
and uh, they're going to talk about, they wouldn't give me a title. They gave me points. Constructive cooperation as opposed to trigger happy litigation. Who would ever do trigger happy litigation? <laughs> Liability in the context of eBay and Richma, dealing with online counterfeits, pre and post Tiffany analysis, comment on the reasonable anticipation standard, touch on international notice and take down legal principles, and a brief summary of the recent trade key case. Jonathan, thank you very much for that introduction. I think there's no better way to illustrate things by in life and especially in presentations like that by way of real life examples. And what I'd really like to do is put in context counterfeiting online. So everything I'm wearing is fake. And most of this was ordered online. So this is a fake Armani suit. This is a fake Dunhill shirt. This is a fake Versace tie. This is a fake Ferragamo belt. Don't take it off. No, I won't. I won't go any further. I won't go any further. I've got to show you my shoes, though. These are Louis Vuitton shoes. Those are uh, Gucci socks. And then I've got a Panerai fake watch. And here is my fake uh, Mont Blanc pen. So I think this illustrates, puts the, this into context. <laughs> Well, these days, it's getting very close to the real price point. Mm -hmm. And you should feel the quality. Come up here and feel the quality of this. <laughs> <laughs> so I think with that introduction, what I'd love to do is take you to a next uh, illustration or an example. And I'm taking you back to June of 1999. I was, in fact, in Debra Boys and Plimpton's office. And I called up Jay. And I said, Jay, I'm sitting in New York, and I remember at that juncture, to put it in perspective, Jay had been at eBay for only a few months. No, one month. Sorry, one month. One, one month. month. Correction, one month. I call up and I say, Jay, I have a document in front of me, eBay's name's on it, but we have a courtesy in this profession before we do something silly. Would you like to talk? And to his ever credit, Jay hopped the red-eye flight that evening, and the next two, three days, we sat in Debevoise and Plimpton's offices, and we hammered out an understanding. We never took the trigger-happy gunslinging approach, as others have in industry with eBay. And through that period of time, I had a number of my colleagues go to eBay's headquarters, and we talked from anything from filters, replica, words, and other uh, fake uh, monikers that were used by the fakesters at that time. And our approach has been, and consistently since then, if I have to act in the best interest of the shareholders and the business, my interest is to bring down the number of fakes on a daily basis on the eBay site. And how am I going to do that? And we took the approach is probably best to work together constructively with eBay. And fortunately, I had Jay on the other end. And since then, that's exactly what we did. We were, in fact, the first to be able to crawl the back end of eBay as a brand owner because Jay and I built up a mutual relationship of trust. And each time I saw lawsuits, the Tiffany lawsuit, the LVMH lawsuit, all these other lawsuits, and saw what was in the complaint, I knew I already had what they were asking for and more. So the question is, what do you want to do in the best interest of your own business? But on that note, I'd like to pass on to Jay so he can give you his side of the story. <laughs> so. It's, it's, I started in May of 1999. My first, basically my first day or maybe my second day on the job, I went to, there were basically two other lawyers in the company. We were only in the US. Uh, the entire company was in two floors of one building. And yet there were a million items on the site and growing daily. It was, it was, this business was going nuts. And there was this thing that the American lawyers will know about called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that had created this great notice and takedown system. So they handed me a paper and I said, this is great. This looks like a copyright notice and takedown form that people fill out. So what do you guys do if somebody complains about trademark? It's my first, like, second day. He looked at me and said, that's a really good question. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is going to be a problem. Um, so uh, we immediately um, had to start thinking about whether to extend the DMCA, which, by the way, had never been uh, discussed in a reported court case. 
rights owners routinely insisted that even that did not apply to eBay. Um, I would get literally sometimes five demand letters a day from firms like Debevoy and Plimpton. And um, people called me on the phone. I spent, I had a headset that I used to walk around where people basically yelled at me all day. And it was, it was an attack from all sides. But in, in fairness, they had a problem. There were definitely people that were misusing our platform. We didn't even have a credit card requirement to register until October of 2000. Can you imagine? People would register, we'd get rid of them, they'd come back, we didn't know who they were, they would list things, they were listing kidneys, which by the way, I believe the first one was a real listing, but we still took it down. They were listing nuclear materials, all of this stuff. But the, the copyright issues and the counterfeit issues were real problems for rights owners. I had been an anti-piracy lawyer for the Walt Disney Company two weeks earlier. I, I got it. Um, now, when I, did, when I did get the letter um, initially from Devil Boy and eventually the call from Fred, you know, I got a lot of threats, but there was something that said, I really think I need to speak to these people because I knew the firm's reputation preceded uh, that call. Richemont's represented, uh, reputation preceded that call, and I knew that this was serious. And one of my jobs was to make sure that we didn't get sued. In fact, we never got sued in a single case involving trademark for five years after I started. It took five years for Tiffany to bring that lawsuit. We did litig litigate copyright issues, but eventually we litigated the trademark issues. Now, all the while, of course, you must know that we spent massive amounts of time deciding what are we going to do about this? What does the law even require? You know, we read the Inwood case. Believe me, I was intimately familiar with Phonovisa because I had used it at Disney to go after flea markets selling counterfeit videos. So it's like, okay, this, this is something, we are in a different world. Now, I don't want to get too far off on the things that you want to come back to, but I, 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 I believe that Tiffany was correctly decided. Uh, you know, maybe as more of an academic matter, I, I take issue with um, David's analysis or conclusion about the, the role of reasonable anticipation, that this notion that generalized knowledge by itself under some circumstances is enough. And first of all, I don't think that the Inwood case says that. I think the Inwood case, and you point this out in your article, which was an incredibly well done, thoughtful article, that the concurring opinion specifically raises this issue and says, look, if you allow that to happen, you've watered down the standard. And the majority, I think it was Justice O'Connor, in a footnote says, yeah, you're right, that essentially that generalized knowledge by itself is not enough, but it is a factor that can be used to buttress an argument for finding liability. And I think specifically she was talking about on the first prong, because it's a two-prong test in Inwood. Prong one is if you intentionally induce infringement, you're, you're, you're gone. Or if you know or have reason to know under certain circumstances, you can be liable. And I think generalized knowledge, in my opinion, absolutely still remains relevant to some of the analysis. What I disagree with, and maybe you're not saying this, but what I disagree with is that generalized knowledge by itself is enough. And what you find, and honestly I think it's understandable, is that rights owners, many of them are often looking for a shortcut solution. It's like, my God, this is a big problem. We're spending a lot of time and money. I've got three paralegals doing X, Y, Z. I get rid of these people and it's a game of whack-a-mole. I mean, I've lived that life and I've heard those arguments over and over, but that does not mean the answer is what I refer to as an all bets are off argument. That if, if you've got a certain amount of generalized knowledge and then you get more and more and there's so much generalized knowledge, at some point we have to throw up our hands and just shut the thing down. And that's kind of what the argument feels like to me that if even if, if and, and I think the flexible approach that David is suggesting probably allows for the Ebays of the world to do the right thing and to avoid liability. And uh, I think that in practice, the other principle that remains alive is this willful ignorance practice, this willful blindness which you mentioned. And the post-Tiffany cases, the post-Ebay cases, tend to be these sites that are just idiots. I mean, they're obviously, in my mind, obviously engaging in criminal behavior. They're probably in cahoots behind the scenes. They've been sloppy in what they've done. They've done sort of the minimum necessary to try to avoid liability. <laughs> But in reality, the totality of the circumstances is that they are 
willfully blind and probably in some way inducing the behavior. One of the cases that Fred's going to talk about is an example of that. For the ordinary course, good faith company like an eBay, I think that specific knowledge is required. Tiffany talks about the 75% survey, which of course you immediately think, well, that means that 25% of what was purchased and examined by them was legitimate Tiffany products. It's called the secondary market. It's totally allowed under most laws in the world. The 75% was based upon a paralegal going and buying the product, not looking at a listing, not looking at an ad, buying the product, examining the product, and even then, that paralegal testified at trial, even she couldn't tell sometimes whether it was legitimate, yeah. which, by the way, puts aside the problem that they had a smelter that was supposed to destroy a bunch of merchandise and failed to do so and snuck that stuff out and was selling it, legitimate Tiffany product that was supposed to be melted down and it wasn't. The, the rights owner is in the best position to make these judgments. It's difficult. And what eBay did is we went as far up to the line as we could without becoming experts in the product. Could, could, could I pick up on that point? I, I'm sorry. I, I was just yeah. going to say, to your point, I'm sure Tiffany would have gotten a lot more had they done what Fred did with you and cooperated than having brought the action in the first place. Because what they Absolutely. were asking for, I know, was consistent with what you've done in other cases. Uh, and and it, just, it just reinforces Fred's point that when you're dealing with a legitimate marketplace like eBay, there's a lot that you can do reasonably. Of course, the real concern is that this standard that has now been set by the court is being used by the really illegitimate yep. markets to try to cover their tracks on the, the worst criminal activities. Okay, wait, wait. If I could just pick up on that. So I uh, just want to show this example. This is a fake Ferrari, just to go back to, I wish I, this wasn't bought online, by the way, but <laughs> it, it, everything that's known to mankind can be faked, and this is an example. I bought this a few years ago to show it in public campaigns against fakes, but it really is true. Uh, but I'd like to pick up on Jay's point, and I'd like to use the railroads as an analogy, and specifically go on... <laughs> On, on, the, on the underlying themes that we've been talking about. This was actually pointed out to me quite a few years ago by a former colleague of mine, Stacey King. She said, if you look at, and we've done that, if you look at the case law in the late 1800s, both sides of the Atlantic, in the US and in the UK, there was this huge debate as to the progress of science with new infrastructure on railroads, who should bear the loss when a locomotive spark would fly off and burn down the farmer's crop. And the question was, and a farmer sued the railroad, and there was a debate on both sides, and there was a lot of case law on this. And the cases went both ways. It's quite interesting. But what really resolved the issue was, in the end, the farmers got together in associations, and the railroads got together, and they let, solved this at a very practical level. So the farmers started doing fire breaks, and the railroad companies started building spark arresters. So at a very practical, non-litigious way was the resolution, in a way, the way we resolve things. But I want to go back to specifically who bears the burden and this point on general, general knowledge. So this is a, an op-ed piece I did for the FT uh, quite a few years ago. And it talks about this railroad analogy, but it goes to the, point, the very point that Jay just made is, how is eBay in a position to know whether something's fake or real? And how do they have that inward standard of knowing or reason to know. And we debated with this at a very practical level because in today's world, as David mentioned a little earlier, it is so true that more and more fakes are at such a very high level, it's impossible to distinguish them from the real thing and the price point's a lot lower. It's far removed from about five years ago, a little more, when I referred to those things that were sold at the fake markets, which I call the genuine fake. The buyer and the seller were not, both knew that something was fake, but it's not so in today's world, and especially in the online world. So uh, if it's difficult for even brand owners to distinguish things, and you've got to do a lot of tests and have jewelers and watchmakers look at things before you can determine whether or not, how's eBay as a platform in a position to know whether something's real or fake? And now I'm going to reverse back into the standard of general knowledge. Now, we know what the position is in the US, but as we know in Europe, generally courts, and especially was epitomized in the Rolex decision in Germany, courts are requiring a general knowledge standard as not being sufficient. You have to have specific knowledge. This was also echoed in the Shanghai court's decision, the Taobao case, 
in a notice and takedown trademark case where the courts required specific knowledge. And I think there is a fair amount of reasonableness underlying that standard because if it's a genuine platform that operates in a proper way uh, on fair and decent principles, there is very little knowledge that can be imputed or uh, knowing or reason to know that that particular item on many different industry sectors is fake or real. So how do you deal with this issue? And um, I'm going to mention a case that we just won recently. Um, sorry, that's an take takedown. The trade key case. Uh, this is in the Federal District Courts of California, and it touches on what David mentioned and actually really nicely overlaps with his reasonable anticipation standard, which I think goes a little further than general knowledge. And what happened here is really hinges on bad faith. Now, I know these are overlapping concepts, but bad faith in this sense goes to the first prong of inward, which is, uh, um, in, in, in essence, inducement and, and, and much more than general knowledge. So let me just, so it's a subject I've over the years, as some of you know, been very interested in bad faith as a specific topic. But in this case, the judge really latched onto this, and I'll give you the factual background because it's quite colorful. So TradeKey is a B2B website which we discovered was selling fakes of a number of our group companies. We did investigations, and it's the first of my entire career, I'd love to hear if anyone else has had this experience, that we've gone either, either a maker or a seller of fakes that would appear in court. Usually it's by default judgment in a story. We had a battle that went on for almost four years against uh, this particular site, TradeKey, which, by the way, I'm advised, is the second largest worldwide site, B2B site, uh, after Alibaba that deals with fakes. Mm. And so we did a fair amount of investigation. We got a court order in the uh, courts in Detroit to seize the servers, and then we had the other side, uh, represented by a well-known law firm in California, uh, against us uh, on taking every single technicality. So we had a court order to seize the service because we had evidence of fakes being sold, and they used the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act against us as an unauthorized access. Well, we had a court order. Something's authorized. And so we had this war of attrition on just formality and technicalities. The judge got pretty fed up in the end. And we got our summary judgment. And it's a very interesting read because you can see the judge latches on to this element of bad faith. And it goes very much in the line of an article written by Stacy Duggan, which deals with this very issue on intermediate liability. And she says, we know it when we see it. Intermediate liability and the internet stamp out bad actors. And she focuses on the element of bad faith. And over the years, when I've spoken to judges, when I've spoken to registrars, when I've spoken to many officials around the world, I've said to them, well, in trademark cases, what swings the case for you? And they've always said, bad faith. When we find bad faith, we smell it. And now, of course, after the domain name procedures, arbitration procedures, always bad faith has become a factor to take into account. And that's exactly what happened here. So in this case, uh, it's post-Tiffany, it's a it's very interesting set of circumstances, it's made interesting law, so it's different to Tiffany in the sense that the factual circumstance of the case is very different. Where eBay set the standard extremely high, invented notice and takedown for trademarks, set the Vero program up, this particular case is on the other end of the spectrum, bad actors, because our investigator uh, let me see if this works. Uh, they, these are just a few examples, apart from fakes. Uh, guns are on sale on this site, bulletproof vests, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. Is that, is that, is that macaroons? What was yeah, it just, just goes on. <laughs> and so here is what we picked up. So uh, our investigator, uh, is it a problem to sell counterfeits on luxury goods? No, it's one of the biggest industries that we rely on to get us a whole lot of revenue. <laughs> Well, I, I think the judge latched onto that. He actually quoted that. And uh, the other thing, too, was we discovered that there was a whole division on fakes being set up in this intermediary. So you, you've got a real bad actor here. And so that's where I think the reasonable anticipation standard works uh, in that particular setting. But I'll hand it so back to Jay. So let me tell you, on the opposite, for a legitimate company, exactly what eBay did do. Um, we had to first make the decision whether we would proactively monitor. The DMCA doesn't require that you proactively monitor to get protection under copyright. There is no law on trademark. 
And I said, you know, lesser of evils, you guys, we have to do this. It, it will not be credible to go, go before a judge someday and say that we sat in our hands, even if technically we can argue that the law allowed that. So we decided to monitor. Then the question is, what does that mean? How far do you go? So we, in, we did this in an, all of the, the, uh, the IP areas, but including trademark, was to develop search terms that in, basically included words that were indicia of piracy or a likely piracy on its face. So if I saw a Chanel listing and it referred to it as a faux, fake, replica, copy, and then, of course, there are gray areas where, you know, inspired by Chanel, it's like, look, we know what's going on over there. You know, inspired by Chanel was like code word for piracy. And we pushed the envelope on what we could proactively find ourselves. We, we had thousands of searches. <laughs> Those results were manually reviewed. I said, I'm not going to allow searches where things are just automatically taken down, because I've also got sellers to worry about, any of whom could sue me for wrongfully taking their stuff down, and I had to deal with that as well. And uh, notwithstanding uh, Tiffany's uh, counsel's statements at the time of the lawsuit to the effect that eBay had refused to cooperate with Tiffany, we had 90 search filters that included the word Tiffany as a search term, plus faux, fake, and all of the others. We had warnings that whenever somebody tried to list a product, this is a, as they're putting it up, if the word Tiffany appeared or other brand names, it automatically delivered a strong warning message don't even think about putting something on this site if it's counterfeit. That was a creative solution. And by the way, I, I want to give props to both um, um, outside counsel and in, inside folks that some of my best ideas for how to solve these problems came from the lawyers who were adversaries to me uh, in these discussions. And I said, look, there's certain things I'm not going to do for you. No, Tiffany, I don't want you to come down and give me a tutorial on how to identify counterfeit silver products. No, Chanel, I don't want to know which watches you made and which watches you didn't. That's not realistic, it's not scalable, and it is in no way consistent with the principle of trademark law, which is that the primary responsibility for policing trademarks is on the trademark owner. Now, you made a really good point that I've heard a lot about technology, and, and technology cannot be used as an excuse. I never went into a discussion with a rights owner and said, well, you know, there's so many listings, this is just so difficult for me, to, for me to manage. Their response invariably was, look, I didn't pick this business, you picked this business. And you know, they were right about that. But the relationship of the technology and the company to the product does matter. It does matter that it's not sitting on a table in a flea market with a handwritten label, which was the fact. It was literally a handwritten label on, you know, Little Mermaid uh, on a flea market. It does matter that there's the physical good is not even present. It does matter that it's just a photograph. It does matter that something like silver, silver looks like silver looks like silver. To me, I can't tell from a picture. What I can tell is what the words are. And you know what? We took it right up to that line, and we said, Tiffany, we need you guys to do your job at this point. So Tiffany's response, well, this is a lot of work. It's costing us a lot of money, you know, blah, blah, blah. We, we understand that. We agree. They said, we want you to treat every listing that sells five items or more as per se infringing. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Sue me if you need to. I'm not going to do that. We went to a conference with the judge. The judge said, are you serious about this? Does that mean if I have five pieces of Tiffany silverware that I got for my wedding, I can't sell it? And then she said to Tiffany's counsel, is it five of the same item or five different items? He didn't know. He hadn't even thought about that. It was an un untenable, unreasonable, and a ridiculous request. I was, and you know what? They maintained that all the way through trial. And I don't think that that, I don't think you're defending, David, that particular request, what you're saying is that there is a totality of circumstances where a website has to do something. You cannot turn a blind eye. And I don't know exactly, you know, what could we have not done and still prevailed? I don't know. Certainly when you get to Fred's case where there's evidence of bad faith, willful ignorance, willful blindness, uh, in the copyright context, Fred Von Lohman, who was at EFF, now at Google, we used to talk about file sharing cases that Sometimes you just get into this case where there's just a gestalt of piracy, and the judge knows it. Everybody in the room knows it. And those people lose, and they should lose. Uh, where companies are trying to do the right thing, particularly as proactively as eBay, 
the balance is struck correctly in the law. I know it's cheaper, it would be cheaper to shut eBay down. I know Tiffany would have a lot fewer paralegals that they didn't have to deal with, with online e-commerce, but I don't think the law dictates that result and I don't think that's right for the business or for the consumer. Thank you both very much. Now, before we, I don't know how much time we've got left. 15, we're good. Okay. Where are the embarrassing questions? Yeah, panelists, yes. I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with the panel, okay. then open it up to the uh, audience. Excellent. Although if the audience, you know, somebody just raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you eventually. <laughs> so my, my, um, my first question, which uh, um, is to Jay and to Fred. Um, As my in, former outside counsel, this better be a <laughs> soft, softball question. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, uh, during the course of um, the uh, eBay L'Oreal litigation around Europe, which I was involved with, with uh, Jay, um, I learned a little bit about uh, the resolution that they had in France and how they solved uh, the issue in France. And what I wanted to ask both of you was whether you considered, um, it is a softball question, um, uh, whether you considered the model uh, law that they have in France where essentially they look at eBay and they say, eBay, you are a broker uh, in between the buyer and the seller, and you are therefore entirely responsible for every transaction that goes through the site, uh, regardless um, of whether you have any knowledge uh, really at all of what's going on. And whether that, um, although... Uh, so it's a softball question, but that has any, any merit at all uh, in terms of responsibility, if, if that was a, a, unitary, uh, a unitary application across the whole, uh, the whole of the e-commerce landscape. Could, could, could I just, just mention in, in, in Jay's defense on this one, and I'm, I speak as a brand owner, I think really this is where one should apply the doctrine of the golden mean, i.e. Confucius's doctrine, which is simply this. You take two extremes and then you get to the answer in the middle. And the extreme, I think that's a very extremist view to draft legislation in that manner when we know the factual reality is that we as brand owners ourselves sometimes don't know whether something's fake or real. We've got to wake up a jeweler at three in the morning to go and look at two pieces and then sometimes it takes the... Sometimes we have to do actually metal tests to see the difference. Fakes are so good at this juncture because of reverse engineering and laser technology. So I think to put uh, an extremist view on that, at the one extreme of Confucius, it's just, just not appropriate. The other one is just to say, well, eBay has, or more importantly, platforms like the trade key has no responsibility whatsoever. That's not right either, because if you remember, Judge Sullivan very clearly talked about reasonable precautions. So you have a raft of factors to look at. So if you look at the two extremes, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. And I think the middle really is, and this has been borne out by and almost 15 years of working together with eBay is to work together to resolve the problem like they did with the railroads. That's where the answer lies, with a balanced approach with a number of factors to determine infringement. I mean, there, there, are, uh, there are protectionist laws in, in a number of countries. I mean, this is right up there with Governor Christie prohibiting direct sales of Teslas in New Jersey. I mean, there, there is a, somebody obviously is benefiting from that, and it is very convenient for brand owners in France to place this enormous responsibility, to misplace this responsibility. There's also a law in France, and I don't know that this is the same law, which uh, creates a classification of, I think, professional sellers, and then that, that if you're doing one-offs, you're okay, but once you go beyond some relatively thro low threshold, even though in the trademark world, total uh, um, exhaustion doctrine, um, first sale doctrine, completely exhausted, you know, anywhere else you could freely resell. But once you cross this threshold, you're a professional seller, you, the brand owner can prohibit you from selling their product. And it's, to me, it's just blatantly about, about preventing the secondary market and having them totally control their markets, which I understand why they want to do it. I don't think it's good policy. And I think this, this notion is a result of major French brand owners bringing a lawsuit in France to protect, you know, the crown jewels of, of some of the industry in France, and I think it's it's unfortunate and not good policy. I, I think what happens here, though, is that straw men get built up, and the notion that brand owners want to stop all secondary sales, my clients who are responsible brand owners do not take that position, uh, and um, 
And I completely agree that these extreme positions are very troubling. The reason that the railroads and the farmers got together was that there was actually quite a lot of uncertainty in the law. There was a lot of risk on both sides. And they decided that they were better off managing that risk working together than taking it to you know, a court trial that could bankrupt either the farm or the railroad. The problem that I see is that the Second Circuit's test, and I, I do agree that on the facts, the result was correct. But the test, to me, is an extreme position. The test that says you only have to take it down if you know that sale number 476248 on eBay is counterfeit. Requiring that level of specific knowledge that this particular listing is counterfeit, and that's the only time when you're liable because you continue to allow that to be sold, to me that actually is an extreme position. And I think that Jay and I actually, uh, although we're trying to be controversial for your benefit, probably agree more than we disagree. I think that's true. I think that's true. Um, but you, you, know, you said something that I thought was really interesting. I mean, you said generalized knowledge by itself is not enough. And of course, I completely agree. The whole reason that my article is about um, platforms having the obligation to take reasonable precautions when they reasonably can anticipate that their sale of counterfeits, it's about the balancing. But what you didn't say, Jay, is I th that it's only enough to find liability if you know that this exact listing is counterfeit. Because I do believe that the trade key case and others show that there are situations where even if you're not willfully blind, although there they may have been willfully blind, actually, yeah. but even if you're not willfully blind, having that level of very specific knowledge shouldn't be enough. And the problem we're facing in, in the post-Tiffany world is that when we complain about counterfeiting to some flea markets or to some online platforms, they say, tell us which exact vendor is selling exactly which product on the third shelf you know, on the right, and sure, we'll go and take it down. And they're relying on the very extreme position that I think the Second Circuit articulated to uh, stop themselves from having to take reasonable steps. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is the, the problem of Tiffany. And it's why I hope, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm chair of the Inter Amicus Committee, and I'm hoping that we get another case in another uh, circuit Trade key. That will trade, go up. Trade key is, you'll see, there's some lovely language in there which takes your reasonable anticipation. Well, trade key is too easy because you, right, you want a, close, a case that's closer to the middle than one that you can. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, the one thing, that, by the way, that we, none of us mentioned uh, is that the other part of the test is not only that you, have, you know or have reason to know, but that you continue to supply the product to that or infringer. Service. And, the, in, you know, we, of course, took the position that a website is not a product court disagree. I think the ship has sailed on that. But the other thing that you have to do is once you take down the specifics, you at some point you then have to suspend the user. Now, suspension is a concept that's in the DMCA. I don't even think they call it that in trademark, but the stopping supplying the product means terminate this user, which of course eBay did vigorously with this very complicated consequence guidelines. And that's the other thing that I'm sure the bad guys aren't doing and don't want to do, nor are they trying to figure out when the bad guy is coming back under another name, which of course eBay spent millions of dollars to solve that. So I, st I think not doing those things and ignoring those things, maybe it's under prong one under inducement, um, but I think you can still get there. It's, but in the middle, there's still that question, what if they don't monitor at all? What if they do everything right up to a line and that's it, not all the stuff that eBay did? I don't think that case has been presented yet. I think that's right. And so, you know, what I see is that when you take an extreme position, the farmer and the railroad will never get together because they have no incentive to work it out. And it's, you know, I think it's very unfortunate that Tiffany pushed this case because it was a bad case with bad facts. But unfortunately, it's now created bad law, and we're all stuck with that. All right. We, we're going to start some questions, okay, uh, from the audience. And I, I want to start with a question. Does anybody, first of all, does anybody here represent Google? Oh. Good. Helen. Helen, good. Then you, you'll speak up in a minute. You know, the, one of the issues that's lurking here that came through the discussion for me is the eBay did something above and beyond the call of then existing law. And so it's a, it's a bit, not, not misleading, but it's not representative of what the law is, of what a company has to do. 
So that's one fact, which it means it like, tells a great story of what can happen if a company's proactive, but it's not necessarily required to be under the law. That's the issue, that, the regulatory issue that we're struggling with. The second issue that I think we're struggling with is I, I leaned over to Etienne uh, and said, is it really true that there's no clear, uniform rule of law on this in the European Union? And he said, no, which seems stunning to me. That, well, we don't have a clear rule, really, but, but there isn't even that much. And, and why has the law not been developed more than that? I think the, the European directive, unlike yeah. the US law, has a notice and a very simple uh, notice and takedown concept that is not just copyright. It actually does apply which is helpful, but it doesn't, it doesn't well, have some of the it, other it, things. It's still under draft, so it's, it's, it's in one of the observatories, and the whole idea is the notion of notice and takedown, not only in the copyright area, but in the trademark area, has been really, really closely scrutinized. And um, there are provisions which are already out there in a directive, but at a national level, it needs to be rolled out. In fact, because of my experience with Jay, if I could just get that slide back, um, I'll show you. With, with the innovation of notice and takedown in trademark law. I did an international comparative study. And the whole idea is that we're a lot closer than we think we are. Because eBay set the standard, countries around the world started looking at this, even in China, very interestingly enough. So you have, a, as it were, almost the railroad analogy where they've gotten together and you've got the notice and takedown standard. WIPO is taking an interest. So the whole idea is to get a common law body in the world, a use gentium, together to set the standard, apart from what was voluntary initially okay, initiated. That's, that's really helpful. I think what's disturbing, I, I tend to find myself with, with David on this because my sense Wait, is... can you say that again? Yeah, <laughs> I tend to find myself with David. My sense is that we've gone even more in, in, into a world, except with one thing, is that I do think technology has changed everything. Not necessarily on what the law should be, but on the scale of what we're talking about here, right? More, it's easier to sell more counterfeit goods uh, at a greater proportion with more deception on more quote unquote platforms and apps and everything else you could imagine than was ever the case 20 years ago. And so to, to not have some kind of more affirmative duty uh, on people who facilitate, know that 30% of their uh, business model is derived from counterfeit goods is a, it's just a growing gap in the law. Now, I don't, what I'm wondering though is if somebody adopted your standard, right, it became the law, uh, how would it change uh, platform uh, behavior? What costs would it impose on platform uh, providers? How wouldn't that, that would vary greatly amongst platform providers? And what are the economic costs of that? Because I think a lot of judicial reluctance in the United States to go that far is fear of, of, of undesirable uh, economic consequences for technology companies and their development. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the answer to that is what's nice about the Tiffany standard is that it's a very bright line rule. And in a sense, courts think that it will decrease the amount of litigation because you've got this bright line rule that platforms uh, can rely on and you know, can almost get motions to dismiss when a case is brought. But the problem with that bright line rule is I think we are uh, allowing far too much bad action. Whereas with this flexible standard I'm proposing, what we have is courts will take into account what does eBay do, what does Alibaba do, what does Trade Key do, how big is the marketplace, um, how big is the problem, and say were the, te the, the obligations you undertook reasonable or not. And what I actually like about that approach is that I think that approach will actually lead to less litigation because it will force the farmers and the railroads to talk to each other instead of thinking, let's actually roll the dice in court. Because they'll know that the standard in court is going to be a, a, re a flexible one of were you reasonable? Were you a bad actor? Or are you actually, you know, like Jay was in the beginning of eBay, recognizing we're on a, it's a brave new world, let's make sure we're acting responsibly. David, do you think if you're sort of on the bad actor side or in the, the dark gray area side, and, and your lawyer, you eventually hire a lawyer and reads the Tiffany case and reads everything that eBay did, they're going to feel comfortable going before a normal judge and saying, yeah, we're doing like basically none of this, maybe a couple of these. I think the, the Tiffany case never decided what the line was, but it's clear that all of that activity greatly influenced the judge in saying, these are not bad actors. These are people trying to do the right thing. And if you're not doing that, 
I would be worried. Even under the current law, I'd still be, I, I mean, so, it may so not be a flexible standard, but I'd be worried. So one, one case is Coach against uh, GADA, which is a New Hampshire case in 2011. And that was a flea market. And the flea market actually defended by saying, I, I know that there's probably some counterfeit being sold to my flea market, but I don't know which exact vendor it is. I know there are some vendors, but I don't know which vendor it is. And under Tiffany, I'm protected. And there was a second case. Uh, it's Omega against 375 Canal, which is a landlord in Chinatown. It's a 2013 case in New York. And again, the landlord said, I know that there's watches being sold in my building, and I know that uh, there's probably some counterfeit, but I don't know which watches, which specific watches that are being sold to counterfeit. I don't have the ability to look at an Omega watch and say that's a counterfeit or not. Under Tiffany, I'm protected. Now, the good news in both of those cases is that the courts rejected that. They said, in this context, um, specific knowledge is not required because you know enough. But the way they distinguished it was by basically saying the online and offline worlds are a little bit different. And so it doesn't yet get to the question of the bad actor in an online environment. I wish we had more time. We're going to take three OK, so we're going to go with questions? OK, first. So uh, mine, I think, should be relatively quick, which is you talked about whether what was done in, say, 2008 or 2000 would still meet a standard in, in 2020. Um, but if you think about, and this may be the distinction between the on and the offline getting bigger, is as we know our customers more and more as, as platforms, as every interaction allows you to, to run more algorithms, do you not think that actually there will become a point, and you, know, you mentioned Google, you know, that incredible level of knowledge will mean that in terms of predicting what looks like a counterfeit sale, to a high degree of, you know, we're talking about balance of probabilities, we're not necessarily talking to beyond reasonable doubt in all cases that actually platforms will be in a better position than they have been in the past to use analytics to really say, this looks like a fraudulent behavior. I, 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 <coughs> I was going to say, I think that's right. But the other thing you need to bear in mind is if, if you move the bar too far, uh, making the platform responsible, you will then disincentivize them from capturing the very knowledge that would enable them to stop the bad acts. Uh, and that's, that, I think, is the challenge in where you set the line as to who's responsible. Go too far and you disincentivize the platform. They're gonna say, you know what? I actually don't want this data. I'll just bin it, because if I've got it, you may turn around to me and say, you now constructively know precisely what's going on. So that's, that's the challenge in terms of where you, where you draw the line. And that sounds a, a little bit like willful blindness, which I wouldn't defend, but what I would defend is, for example, I could go and say, we're gonna, new policy, we're gonna do a single purchase of eBay seller products or make them send us a sample and I'm gonna get silver testing technology so I can determine whether it's you know real Tiffany silver. Yeah, I could do that. But come back to the principles of trademark law. Who has the primary burden of uh, responsibility of policing the mark? You know, the fact that a company could do something doesn't mean that the right balance of policy is that that responsibility is put on me versus, you know, or the landlord or the flea market. I mean, you yourself said Pick up a watch. I can't tell whether it's an Omega. If you tell me it's an Omega, I'll remove it. If this person does it again, I will get rid of this vendor forever. What more do you want me to do? Go down to the Omega factory and get the spec sheets? I don't think the trademark law in, a, in a, the old world or the new world requires that. Alan. Oh, no. Okay. Um, I have a question for Paul Stevens. Um, do you think that the European legislator might introduce new notice and takedown procedures. And isn't it true that the European legislator already introduced a kind of notice and takedown procedure in the field of customs seizures, where the right owner says, I know that there are counterfeits out there. The customs say, uh, really, what about this special shipment? The right owner says, yes, that's counterfeit, and the customs takes down the shipment. <coughs> And what does all this tell us for contributory infringement? So uh, the short answer to your question is I think, yes, it will come in terms of notice and takedown. Um, I think the differences between um, the, how the duty arises uh, in terms of contributory infringement in Europe are so vastly different uh, that it, it's going to take a really... Um, 
uh, strong hand at the community level to bring in anything which will change that. I mean, Germany, which I know where you're from, um, has its own concept of interference in rights. As I say, France is a very different concept. In the UK, we're, we're much more closely allied to uh, US in terms of common design or inducing an infringement. They are radically different ideas, um, and it's going to take a very strong degree of will to, to, to go across the European community and say, you know what, guys, you're going to have to, to completely uh, change the way you've thought about uh, contributory um, liability uh, for the last however many hundreds of years, and we're going to impose a single burden. It's, it's not like tweaking trademark law. Um, it, it will require a, a very different change of mindset and jurisprudence, and that's, I think, some way off. I, I wish there were a statute, by the way, because it would provide yeah. immunity, some qualified immunity for the, for the operator to take things down and not worry about getting sued by their user, which is not in the trademark law right now. Ella? Um, this has been a fantastic panel, and I think you've raised a lot of important questions. I believe in the golden mean. I think the whole debate on how much the Internet is going to continue to look like a brick and mortar world or not just on sheer scalability and technology, as David said, is got to change it in balance. But I think the other thing that's also happening is what's the question of reasonableness? You know, a judge who's, you know, in his mid-60s and how much technology and looking is going to be reasonable may be a very different standard than, you know, the 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds who are much more tech savvy about coming up and what's a reasonable amount of technology that you're supposed to have. Um, not just that you do have and what do you use it and how do you do it. Um, I just want to throw out to the panel, what's your idea of the platform liability, platform liability in quotes, um, for the credit card companies? Because that's a whole other piece uh, that... Could I, could I jump in on that? <laughs> I've, I've been after the credit card company, so we follow the money. And uh, we've done some joint, joint action, legal action, with, with other uh, participants and, and brand owners in our industry. And it's very, it's really crucial. You feed it on the nail there. You follow the money and you really get to stop counterfeit activity. So I, I'd be very keen uh, on a very similar standard uh, that makes credit card companies liable in, in very much the same way. Okay, on that note, I think we need to end this panel. This has been fabulous. Thank you very much. We're going to take a 15-minute break now, so we'll get started again at 11.20. Thank you. Sure.